Hello, everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. This is a very special day for a few reasons. To host Dr. Princeton and Dr. Eve Telzer, I don't like to throw around the title expert very often, but when it comes to these, these two, that's the only word to use. And so I'm so grateful for your time. We have people here in person at the Naperville Village Council Chambers. I'm so excited about that. And we've got people at home. Um, and that's our ask of everyone who's listening in to please share the resource. We are the GPS parent series for parents who live across the street or across the country. And so like us on social media and share, we're here weekly uh, presenting programming for parents of children of all ages. And we couldn't do it without our many sponsors. And one of those sponsors is Kids Matter, who's also co-hosting along with Kathy today. So before we begin our very important program, just really quickly, just a few upcoming events that I know you won't want to miss. Uh, next week is a special event. It's happening at the uh, College of DuPage at 1045 and then at night at Glenbard South. There's a film that just came out called Screenagers Under the Influence about vaping, alcohol, and cannabis. At 1045, we'll be showing that film only in person. And then at 11, a hybrid will be showing, we'll be having uh, Dr. Tim Fong. He's an adolescent medicine psychiatrist from UCLA and a Glenbard grad uh, talking about the film. So if you can't make it in person to the College of DuPage, listen at noon uh, hybrid and we'll be discussing everything that we learned. The same thing will happen at night on the 29th. At six o'clock, we'll be showing the film in person at Glenbard South and then the conversation at seven will continue as a hybrid. So do join us for this important topic. Uh, then into December, uh, with a free book event, we are hosting Michelle Eichert. She is back and talking about her new book, Eight Failures, Eight Setbacks That Can Make a Child a Success. Uh, that takes us into some important programming in, in September. Uh, in, in December, we're hosting Dr. Christine Crawford. She'll be talking about mental health and what you need to know. Uh, the next program into the, the last week of December, we'll be talking about self-compassion. So lots of programming. Uh, take a look at the website, share again, and before we go any further, I want to take a minute to thank, again, Kids Matter and the branch for this opportunity to bring people in person, breathing human beings, to be here in community, and we love that. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Dr. Kathy is the founder of the Branch Moms Network, and she'll do the introduction. So, Kathy? Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Gilda. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and co-hosting this event with Kids Matter, with the Glenbard Parent Series, with uh, the Naperville Park District, and also the Collaborative Youth Team. Uh, I am actually the founder of the Branch Moms Community, based mostly in Naperville, Illinois, and the Chicago area, but um, we are all throughout the country as well. Um, this topic of social media and teens and tweens comes up literally daily on our community groups of the branch. Um, moms are distraught. Uh, parents are distraught, not knowing how to navigate this really challenging topic that I didn't have to deal with growing up. I didn't get a cell phone until I was 27 years old. Um, so having these teens go through what they're going through, we see the pain come through our community. So that's why it's such an honor to be a part of this. Uh, just such an, such an important topic that I think does not get enough. We don't have enough information on how to handle it as a parent. So thank you both for being here. Um, so I'd like to take the chance to introduce both of our experts today. Um, there are a lot of really big words here because you both are very smart people, obviously. So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Eva Tesler. Um, she is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and co-director of the Winston National Center on Technology Use, Brain, and Psychological Development. Dr. Tesler's research focuses on both antisocial um, examples being risk-taking and substance abuse and pro-social examples, helping and empathy behaviors from childhood to adulthood with a focus on adolescence as a, prime, a particularly sensitive and flexible phase of the brain development. She seeks to examine how family and peer relationships shape the long-term psychological well-being of youth via changes in brain function and structure which is no easy task, obviously. Uh, so welcome. 
Uh, Dr. Mitchell J. Uh, Princeton, uh, PhD, is the American Psychological Association's Chief Science Officer and the John Van Setter's Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Chapel Hill. Uh, he has published hundreds of scientific articles and nine books. His research has focused on adolescence popularity and peer relations. He also has examined the associations between adolescents' interpersonal experiences and psychological symptoms. He is the author of the popular Finding Happiness and Success in a World that Cares Too Much About the Wrong Kinds of Relationships and has written for or been interviewed by hundreds of mainstream media outlets. Welcome, doctors. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. I believe, uh, Gilda, are you going to come back to join yes, us? Still? We're going to take it away. Oh, wonderful. Well, then you will just take it away. Thank you so much. All right, we will. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us as part of this wonderful speaker series. We are going to talk with you about the research that we have so far, but maybe I should preface this for a moment just by saying that while some of what you hear likely will be a little alarming. We're hoping that by the end of this hour, you have some real sense of tools and directions and ideas for what you can do, what you could do today to really help in this situation and hopefully have a more balanced perspective on this issue. I know sometimes uh, this topic can be a bit scary, but we're hoping that you leave feeling empowered and a sense of agency. Um, Dr. Telzer and I uh, approached this topic after many years of studying relationships, including peer relationships. And some of what we study comes in a broader frame of how it is that we understand relationships and their importance to our functioning and brain development overall. You know, actually, if you look back at anthropology research to many millennia ago, um, you'll learn that we were not the only human-like species on the planet back then. In fact, the others were probably more likely to have made it this long, and we would have gone extinct, except for one thing we had that these other species did not have, and that was a genetic mutation that changed the shape of our voice box and an area of the brain able to receive and understand language. That was really important because language allowed us the ability to become a social or a herding species, and that gave us the opportunity to work together to protect one another and so on. Well, that's so many years ago. Why is it relevant now? Well, actually, you know, there are still quite a number of signals that we can find both in the brain and elsewhere that tell us that our ability to be a social species and to remain remarkably um, connected to others socially, even um, finely attuned to sensitivities in the social space is still very, very powerful. For instance, some research has been done to try and look at what the experience of social exclusion would be look like by having participants represented by a hand and participate in a game of catch with who they think are two other participants. And as this ball gets thrown between the participants, uh, their brains can be scanned in an fMRI. Research has found that at some point, if you show that these two, not really participants, just a computer program, start throwing the ball back and forth to each other, it makes this person feel excluded. And when that happens, the regions of the brain that are activated overlap with the same regions that you would see for physical pain. Not just the, not the sensory cortex part that would make you say, ouch, but rather a part of the brain that sends us an important warning to tell us that whatever we're doing, we should do the opposite or something you know, immediate to protect our survival. There's also been remarkable research just in the past 10 years to show us that at that moment of social exclusion, Within only about 30 to 40 minutes, you can see through blood draws that dormant DNA has suddenly been activated to say that social exclusion is now preparing your body for a full inflammation response. So when we talk about the role of social media or the role of kids' social relationships on their brain development and their well-being, it's important to recognize that we are very much a social species that is very finely attuned to even the subtlest of cues that might indicate that we are losing our standing in the social context. Well, we've had plenty of things that have happened in the technology space before that have changed our social relationships, the printing press, the telephone, email, um, but we're talking about social media and we're talking about it with a little bit more emphasis than perhaps people used to talk about some of those other advances. One reason why is because 
we've um, done some work to demonstrate that there are ways in which social media seems to be changing many different aspects and qualities of our social interactions all simultaneously. We can now interact with each other, not in real time. Whatever we say, do, or post is a matter of permanent record for the entire World Wide Web to see. And we have to be available, or some kids think they, sh they should be, to be able to respond to all of those cues all the time. Those cues are very different. Our brains and our history allows us to pick up on even the most subtle of social cues. But we've really kind of reduced a lot of our social communications to simply the presence or absence of a thumbs up icon. And that has changed our ability to communicate sophisticated and complicated concepts that we might have partial agreement with or you know, mixed feelings about, but there's no real room to be able to say that. We now actually rate each other. We vote each other's thoughts, pictures, opinions, belief systems up and down, and you can see how many votes people are getting. And for the first time in the history of our human species, we've actually outsourced some of our decision-making in the social context to a computer that now tells us who to be friends with and what order we should see their posts and reminds us when it's time to interact with them again. Those might be helpful things, but they also change the nature of our social development in remarkable ways we're just beginning to understand. What does it look like for us? Well, it used to look like this when young people interacted. Then it looked a little bit like this. And as you probably know very well, this is what it looks like now when young people interact with one another. And this kind of parallel play, while well, even in person, young people are looking at their phones and posting and commenting on uh, and, and really focusing more on the device than each other when they're in each other's space is a very big difference for the first time in thousands of years that we have socially interacted differently. So a lot of people suggest that, in fact, social media is the reason why um, we are currently experiencing a youth mental health crisis. In fact, some have suggested that we can time the introduction of Facebook to significant and dramatic increases in a number of different symptoms. Well, these are data from the Centers for Disease Control that have done epidemiological surveys across the entire country every two years to look at a wide array of risk behaviors and symptoms of psychopathology. And what you can see here is um, there actually does not seem to be a very dramatic or consistent trend where social media has led to um, remarkable increases in suicide attempts. In fact, instead, if you look over 50 years, you see that there's been a very big increase but not quite as dramatically since social media was introduced. We do not see an increase in, in um, substance use or uh, body related issues, despite the visual medium that social media emphasizes. Um, we do see some increases in depression over time. So really some mixed data there. We do need to keep in mind that, uh, oh, excuse me, that data do suggest actually that when kids report uh, why they believe there's a youth mental health crisis and what the primary sources of stress are for them, at least in the states, they talk about things more like school shootings, exposure to violence or sexual assaults, unrealistic academic pressures, polarization, their concerns about existential issues like climate change, and the extent to which they see their leaders criticizing their, uh, their exploration of their own identities. What we wanna talk about then is what we understand about social media in the context of brain and psychological development from a more balanced perspective. And to do so, we need to just mention a couple of things briefly first about the adolescent brain. Now we all know that the body changes during puberty. Um, what many don't realize is that the brain has started the process of those significant changes about a year or two before you start seeing changes on the outside of the body that would signal that puberty has started. So one of the first regions of the brain that uh, starts to develop during that 10, 11 year old period is the ability to roll uh, their eyes, usually at adults and their parents. And the reason why that's happening is because of a proliferation of dopamine and oxytocin receptors that are occurring in this more inner region of the brain that's shared with many mammals. In fact, even mice, research says, prefer to hang out with adolescent mice more than they do adult mice during their own pubertal development. And that has to do with this orientation towards bonding with peers and that 
sense of reward that comes from, you know, having positive interactions and attention from peers. That means that starting around the age of 10, kids are really hypersensitive to peer feedback, attention, or punishments. And as a parent, if your kids have not been through this stage yet, you might find that they have nothing more to talk about. They can talk about nothing other than who sits with whom, who likes whom, who likes people in different ways, who's in which friendship click, and so on. Now, this um, area on the top of the brain for humans, this uh, cortex area, is very unique to our species. And in particular, this area in the front develops towards the end of pubertal uh, development. In fact, it's uh, in the mid-20s. It's still just finishing up its uh, development. And that's important because this is an area that one might refer to as the brain's breaks or the inhibition center. It helps us to think about and deliberate and often stop ourselves from pursuing every possible impulse. Well, that means from the age 20 uh, of 10 or so, most kids are going to be very interested in any way that they can get positive reinforcement or attention from the peers. And until around their mid-20s, they're not going to be able to stop themselves from pursuing every one of those opportunities. So when we talk about social media, we want to mention a couple of pieces here. One is that every single person and every single platform has a very different experience on social media from one another. That's because social media is really a combination of the content that we choose to put on, we choose to go and seek out and look at, or content that's presented to us beyond our choice, combined with a number of platform functions. Things like the opportunity to vote uh, comments or posts with likes, to add written comments, to follow somebody, an endless scroll feature. These are all things that are attached to the content. And then, of course, there's new, the artificial intelligence that might um, generate opportunities for us based on its assumption of our interests uh, based on past behavior. We do not have any one particular age at which we think it is okay versus not okay to be on social media because we really have to talk in a much more sophisticated way about the research. And of course, adolescent development is gradual and continuous. None of us wakes up on our birthday suddenly with a whole new set of competencies that we did not have the night before. We have to recognize that there are many ways that the online environment reflects the offline world, including ways that things like racism and bias might be built directly into the platforms themselves by their human developers. We also should say, as we're about to launch into this review of the research out there, that it would be unethical for scientists to force some kids on social media and force other kids to refrain so we can make the kind of randomized clinical trial causal data available. Instead, what we can do is we can look at the extent to which experiences seem to predict the development or change in adolescents' own functioning over time while controlling for possible confounds. Overall, what you're going to hear is that the findings are actually a bit more complex, which means a few more opportunities for what you can do as parents and educators than perhaps what you've heard so far. For instance, who kids are and what uh, psychological vulnerabilities they may experience, such as mood or anxiety symptoms, might actually affect what they choose to go and pursue and do online. When we see a correlation between tech use and psychopathology, we also have to recognize that it might be because kids are seeking tech in order to provide coping skills or compensatory skills, like developing the opportunity to deal with social anxiety or maybe for kids with pervasive developmental disorder to be in a structured social setting. We also have to keep in mind that a correlation between tech use and kids' development is ignoring the possibility that what we're really seeing is the effect of what's been taken away during every minute that kids are spending to use online instead. As scientists, we don't look at social media as all good or all bad. We instead wonder under what conditions and for which children might there be particular aspects of social media that might help their development or might harm their development. And the way that we do that is that we look at many different smaller questions that get to that broader issue about social media. In a very fast way, we're going to review at least nine of those different topics to give you a sense of what we're learning so far within the literature. For instance, one thing that's really important to emphasize is that research has identified that there are positive aspects to social media use, perhaps especially for those from 
um, marginalized or minoritized communities who may um, provide, who may have the opportunity to connect with others who are um, sharing the same identity as them. For instance, racial, ethnic, sexual, or gender identities that maybe kids have very few folks in their offline environments or even in their own households who share the same identity as they do. And it's found that um, kids actually provide an opportunity to talk about minority stress and to provide each other social support and rapid access worldwide social support for even the smallest or more, most uh, concerning of their stressors. There's some research demonstrating that kids report they have friends with folks online that they know they will never meet offline. And those friendships might be very high in adaptive friendship quality, so much so that it can buffer the effect of stress on even the most severe outcomes, in fact, reducing the likelihood of future suicidal attempts. During COVID, research demonstrated that those on social media actually had less negative consequences because of their opportunities to connect with others online. We see that there's greater diversity among our online peer contacts than we have among our offline peer contacts. So of course that's great. And although we don't let adolescents do everything that they tell us they like, um, it is notable that adolescents report that they do enjoy these experiences most of the time. We also have seen remarkable civic engagement and activism on important society issues led by youth because of social media. But there's also some research that's suggesting that kids use social media in very different ways. Some might use it in order to see what's trending and learn about the news or sports or entertainment information and to share that and discuss it among their friends. But there are others who might be particularly likely to go online to compare themselves for other, to others or to seek feedback on their own appearance, their own thoughts, or to try and gain followers um, or likes on their profiles. It appears that those are particularly bad ways of using social media, at least when it comes to longitudinal risk for psychological symptoms. It's really hard for teens not to believe everything that they see online. And often those are what we call upward social comparisons because people don't post when they look their worst or when they're at their most lonely. They post curated, maybe even filtered or doctored images of when they look their best and when they're at the most glamorous of locations surrounded by the most friends possible. That, that kind of upward social comparison is hard for all of us if we don't consistently remember that what we're seeing is not representative of people's lives. As a result, those who engage in that particular kind of social media use have increases over time in depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and also weight-related behaviors. Primarily, this has been seen among females, but we're seeing rapidly an uh, increase among males, even including weight-related behaviors due to um, norms around thin uh, muscularity that are promoted quite actively on social media as well. There's a remarkable amount of research demonstrating very concern, uh, concerning levels of cyber hate that kids are experiencing online. For instance, this is just one of many studies demonstrating that a remarkably high percentage of folks have seen that there have been posts towards racial or ethnic minoritized groups attacking those groups as uh, an entire um, group of people or attacking individuals because of their membership in those groups. And we see the exact same data when it comes to those who are witnessing um, cyber hate directed towards gender, or um, sexual minoritized youth as well, as well as other groups too. Interestingly, being exposed to this kind of cyber hate predicts anxiety and depression over time. Even if you account for how much kids have experienced or been the targets of the same kinds of experiences offline. And that might be because what they see online is usually harsher than what happens offline because it can be anonymous, it could be more severe, and it can have pile on with comments and likes attached to it. Interestingly, research has also demonstrated that this not only is a, uh, has an effect on the victims of cyber hate, but simply being a bystander, seeing cyber hate online is related to these outcomes as well, even if you're not a member of the group that's being attacked. Not, parent, not many parents realize just how common it is that adolescents are directed to sites or um, connections through social media 
that actually teach them how to engage in maladaptive or dangerous behaviors. For instance, one of those would be non-suicidal self-injury, which is defined as hurting yourself, your body tissue, without the desire to die. The most common um, example of this is cutting behavior. Many years ago, YouTube, before they changed their policies, um, was um, audited for the number of kind of videos that they had specifically um, pertaining to cutting or other forms of NSSI. And what they found was that, well, despite the fact that most people who have engaged in this behavior report that seeing images of folks cutting triggers them to do it again, the majority of videos on YouTube at the time had no warnings about triggers. And about a quarter to almost a third actually encouraged kids and taught them how to cut and how to keep that behavior from their parents. Now, you should know that YouTube has changed their policies since then, but TikTok has not, at least not in the United States. So these are still very concerning statistics as if they were applied to other platforms today. You might have heard of similar kinds of things with other dangerous or maladaptive behaviors, including pro-anorexia sites, referred to among teens as pro sites, where kids have the opportunity to post images of unhealthy body shapes they wish to attain, to post rules that uh, give you entry into this community, and if you violate those rules by engaging in healthy behavior, you're kicked out of the friendship community, or by showing art that encourages people to remain adherent to anorexia-style behaviors. Still another area of research has really looked at the ways in which we all, but especially kids, engage in some misestimation errors or processes of overgeneralization. Think about this for a second um, in the way that you yourself might experience, uh, have an experience when you read, let's say, an article online and you dare to venture to the comment section where there's all kinds of things that are posted on there, often anonymously. You may see three or four posts on there that espouse a viewpoint that you completely disagree with and have an option at that point. You could say, wow, there are three or four people with radical opinions who read this paper. Or you could say, wow, I think that actually represents like half the country. And, and this makes me feel unsafe even in my community or you know, um, among all the people who read, read the paper. Um, that's a very common mistake to make because we as, um, as humans who are taking in a remarkable amount of social information are actually programmed as we are raised to try and make the broadest of conclusions with the littlest of information sometimes. It's very adaptive if every time we receive information, we're able to fit it into an overall sense of what we think the world is like. So we're very prone to making those kinds of estimation errors. Well, social media may exacerbate this because it does give you the opportunity to simply click a like button and see numbers on there, which can be very deceiving. In this research, um, the investigators found that when ninth graders were exposed to posts that showed people drinking or talking about drinking and they had likes attached to them, it in fact had a very significant effect on adolescents' beliefs that perhaps all of their peers thought that it was okay to drink um, before they were legally able to do so and to drink um, heavily, and especially uh, in, in this case, excuse me, five or more drinks on a single occasion, which is a fair amount for an adult let alone for a 13 to 14 year old. And sure enough, once teens had perceived that their peers approved of this behavior, this was then subsequently related to adolescents' own initiation of heavy episodic drinking in the ninth grade, really demonstrating this very clear connection between what we see online, how it changes what we think of others, and how that influences our own behavioral choices. Remember, of course, that these processes can also be used to promote adaptive behavior. So if there were social media posts right now talking about community service or being kind and empathic towards others, it can also have the same effect. This has just not been frequently uh, studied as much as studying some of these risk behaviors. I'll say another area of research has been on the extent to which kids are telling us that they're experiencing a new kind of stressor that most of us who grew up without social media just didn't have when we were teenagers. And that's the extent to which social media has created a whole series of tasks and anxieties that just don't have an offline version. Um, some of you can probably relate to the number of notifications, 
um, and, and dings and reminders that you might get on your phone or on your computer telling you that people are trying to connect with you. But of course, for teens, all those connections are very important because these are their friends and they're biologically primed to care very deeply about their social experiences. So much so that many report that they are afraid that if they don't keep up with the social information, they'll be at a disadvantage the next time they talk with their friends or go to school and they'll miss out on the important information. For that reason, uh, many kids feel like they can't walk away from their phone or step away for too long, or they'll miss out on information to comment on their friends' posts or learn information. And if they themselves post anything, they might spend over a half an hour just hitting refresh to make sure that they're getting um, positive comments and many likes on their posts, um, as opposed to being canceled based on what it is they put up there. We did research among kids just around ninth to 10th grade and learned that about 50% of kids just under were reporting so much digital stress that it was interfering with their ability to engage in their daily normal roles and routines. And the more digital stress they experienced, the more they reported depression a year later. So with that, let me um, turn it over to Dr. Telzer to talk about some of the other research findings in this area. Great. Thank you, Dr. Princeton. So one of the other areas that has garnered a lot of research and actually shows some of the most causal links is that with sleep. So first, it's really important to note just on average that adolescents are pretty sleep deprived. For example, about 40% of ninth graders are not getting or are getting um, the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. And this declined substantially over the high school years so that by the end of high school at 12th grade, only about 25% of adolescents are getting the recommended eight hours of sleep. And this is concerning on its own. Poor sleep is linked to obesity, depression, risky behaviors, poor school performance. It really interferes with every aspect of adolescents' uh, daily lives. Now, when it comes to social media and screen time, there's research showing that about 60% of adolescents are viewing or interacting with their screens in the hour before bedtime. And unfortunately, this is linked to some negative outcomes. Go ahead and click. Thank you. <laughs> so adolescents who view and interact on their phones at night, whether that is, um, linked to interacting with peers and experiencing digital stress, as Dr. Princeton was talking about, or merely the blue light emitted from their screens. This is linked to poor sleep health. Adolescents who are using their smartphones before bed have a later sleep onset. They have a shorter sleep duration overall. And when they wake up in the middle of the night, adolescents who reach over and grab their phone and check them end up staying awake longer in the middle of the night. And poor sleep is um, really concerning when it comes to interfering with their daily lives, but it's also impacting their brain health. Adolescents who are getting variable amounts of sleep throughout the week end up showing disruptions in how their brain is developing over the adolescent years. So this is one of the areas where we have really strong evidence to underscore that the nighttime screen use and interacting on their digital platforms should really be reduced in order to impact adolescents overall health, ranging from their ability to engage in school to having healthy brains. Now, as we talked about earlier in this talk, there's many aspects of social media that can be very positive for adolescents, but there are signs at which social media use may become more problematic. So what we've done is we've developed some measures that help us understand when social media behaviors might become more problematic. And these are the types of behaviors that, that um, start to interfere with adolescents' daily lives. So for example, we've asked adolescents these types of questions. Many of you may um, answer yes to these yourselves. So for example, do you ever feel like you spend more time on social media than you intended? Have you ever tried to spend time away from social media, but you couldn't do it? Do you ever expend extra effort to make sure that you have access to social media, et cetera? So all of these questions really get at, at the idea that social media behaviors may be becoming more problematic as they're interfering with adolescents' daily lives and may be a sign that they're, they're more addictive. Now, when we ask adolescents these very questions, what we find is that nearly all adolescents report that they're spending more time on social media than they intended, 
about half of adolescents report that being away from social media results in experiencing difficulties in engaging with their daily life and activities. And about a quarter of adolescents actually indicate that they are moderately or severely addicted to social media. So this really underscores that the majority of adolescents are experiencing some signs of problematic social media use um, in the general population. Now, what we sought to understand is, are there particular adolescents, can we predict who might become addicted to social media, who may have more problematic social media based on how their brains are developing? We know that this is a really important developmental period when the brain's undergoing um, changes, it's becoming more sensitive to its environment, to rewards in its environment. And these changes in the brain for some adolescents may determine who ends up um, becoming more or less addicted to their social media platforms with downstream implications for their mental health like depression. So we've conducted longitudinal research to, to look at this. And what we find is um, represented here showing developmental changes in the brain. This red line here is showing the adolescents who go on to develop social media addiction like behaviors a couple of years later. And these early changes in the brain where it's becoming less and less sensitive to rewards in this particular area of the brain helps us predict which adolescents might become addicted to their social media. And this is also then linked to depressive symptoms, particularly for girls. And so this just helps us to identify certain adolescents who may go on to develop problematic social media behaviors in the adolescent years that may place them at risk, especially amongst girls for depressive symptoms later on. We've also done research looking at the other direction. So the social media addiction tells us um, what brain vulnerabilities may predict the development of social media addiction behaviors. We've also sought to understand, can social media actually shape the developing brain? Are the experiences that adolescents have online? Dr. Princeton mentioned some of the very unique ways of which social media platforms fundamentally change adolescent social development. Might this be changing the way their brains are developing? <clears throat> So in order to really understand and unpack the frequency with which adolescents are interacting on their social media platforms, how often are they checking and using their smartphones, we collected this very objective data using screenshots from adolescents' phones. And for every day, so across two weeks, every single day, adolescents uploaded a screen a screenshot of their phone usage. And this is objective. So it's not asking you to try to remember how much time were you on your phone yesterday, but we can see from the phone's metrics, their, their phone usage. It's also not retro, retrospective, so you don't have to remember for days or weeks on end. And what we end up with is thousands of data points indicating the frequency with which adolescents are checking their phones, for example, their messages or TikTok or YouTube, and how much time they're spending on their phones. And what we find is plotted here, this might look quite um, overwhelming to, to view in on, but what each column there represents is one day in the week of our data collection. And this top row, every single one of those dots is one person. And this top row is showing how frequently they're checking their smartphones every day. And what we find is that on average, adolescents are picking up and checking their phones about 100 times a day on average. But this ranges from zero to upwards of 400 times a day. So adolescents are, ch are constantly checking their phones, looking for notifications, looking for messages from their friends, checking their social media platforms. On the bottom is the average time that they're just spending on their phone. And on average, adolescents are spending 500 minutes a day on their phone. That's over eight hours, which for many adults is over a full workday spent glued to their phones. Again, if you um, look at the variability here, we can see that some adolescents are spending zero minutes a day on their phones, but other adolescents are upwards of over a thousand minutes a day. That's 16 plus hours a day just on their smartphone. So they are just glued to their phones. Now, what we're really interested in is how this might be related 
to things like reward seeking behaviors and how the brain might be changing um, developmentally as it responds to rewards in, in its environment. And what we find if we ask adolescents in the moments that they're using their phone, their feelings of like reward seeking, so seeking out sensations or social interactions in the immediate hour after adolescents use their phones to connect with their peers, they are reporting this increased sense of social um, uh, sensation seeking and they crave more social interactions. So just the behavior of going online to connect with their peers seems to be related to greater reward seeking behaviors in those moments as they unfold. And so we're interested in whether this might actually be um, impacting the way their brain is developing and responding to rewards in their environment. And so what we did is we looked at the frequency with which adolescents are checking their phones and we scan their brains every year for three years to see how their brains are changing developmentally across this really important developmental period. As Dr. Princeton said, when the brain is really going through more uh, reorganization and becoming really, really sensitive to peers in their environment. And what we find is um, depicted here, these are changes in the brain that are related to how frequently adolescents are checking their social media platforms. And this blue line here is showing those who are habitually checking their social media accounts, those who are just constantly um, every day checking their social media, they're showing increases in activation in the brain as it responds to social rewards in the environment, suggesting that these adolescents are becoming hypersensitive to rewards. Their brains are just becoming tuned into those social rewards and punishments in a way that's making them very hypersensitive to these potential cues on social media. And this may shape brain development well into adulthood. And so together, these are suggesting that there are ways of which the brain might be developing that might be shaping adolescent social media experiences that may help us predict which adolescents might become addicted to their social media accounts and social media may actually be shaping the brain. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Princeton who's gonna um, give us some tips on what parents and educators can do to help adolescents. Thank you so much. Um, so there are a number of things that are possible to, um, to do right away and we're pleased that some of this has been picked up and is being now um, communicated by a number of different groups out there um, where there are some similarities in the kinds of suggestions. For instance, one opportunity is simply to wait before allowing your kids to use technology. We have no data to suggest that waiting um, places kids at a social disadvantage in any way, despite most parents believing that the number one reason why they're giving their kids phones is because they don't want their kid to be the only one left out. But in fact, we're starting to see that some of the more popular and socially competent kids are not getting on social media because they recognize that it's inauthentic and it makes them actually feel worse rather than feeling better. Sometimes um, there are opportunities like wait until eight that create an uh, a community decision where parents can find support with other parents to agree together to wait. And that helps to explain to kids that you, know, you, you are not the only one that's not giving your child a smartphone or letting them use social media platforms, that it's you as well as some or many others in that child's class or grade. Um, there are ways in which we expect adolescents to develop healthy social relationships during this age. And if social media is used to help promote those types of relationship skills, that would be fantastic. So that means using it as an opportunity to provide support for each other to use it to learn information about others. So that way you can have face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice conversations where you probe more further, or you probe more deeply and engage in emotionally intimate conversations about what you've learned on social media. In other words, to use it to actually form relationships rather than just to extract numbers or followers or like counts that are devoid of the human behind um, each of those numbers. And there are a variety of ways that this can be done. It is really important to select social media um, platforms that allow for safe interaction. That means that either um, not selecting platforms or shutting down the um, options that allow for open chat, which may include chat with folks who are predators or are not saying who they or are not who they say they are. Taking down opportunities to interact with adult-like content 
or not allowing individuals to participate on platforms that have an AI component. Um, it's impossible for parents to truly monitor everything it is that their parent that their kid is doing on social media. Um, you'd have to be staring over their shoulder all the time. But there are ways that parents can monitor and help in this situation, nevertheless. One is, is to use those screen time controls to limit the number of hours or minutes a day that kids are using devices, what times of day and which apps in particular. I know on the Apple device devices in particular, um, it is it is possible to set up all those controls. It's a little bit less intuitive than I would like, but it's still possible. But perhaps more important is to make sure that we're talking with kids about what they consume online and asking them, what do they think it would mean if someone posted something on this topic or that topic? What does it mean when people say that they like a post that seems to suggest something that's illegal or, or inappropriate? And that kind of opportunity um, helps kids learn that their parents are a safe and knowledgeable source to talk about what they're learning online. Too often, many of us have the temptation to tell our kids that we didn't grow up with this and we don't know why they spend so much time on it and they should just put it down. And that um, may reflect our feelings, but it does accidentally communicate a message to kids that says, if you do have questions or confusion about what you're seeing on there, I'm not the person to talk to about it. So instead, we should really be validating the importance of their online experiences and asking them to teach us what they see, how they make sense of it, and how to help them. We should try to be careful that we are um, taking, and this is really for the tech companies to do, but tech companies really do need to take down content that is either um, cyber hate or is um, reflecting dangerous and maladaptive behaviors. And because we know many kids will be exposed to cyber hate, we might want to, as adults, have conversations um, with kids about what they would do if they found themselves uh, seeing that kind of a post. How could they stand up for others or how can they make comments or unfollow or do something to sanction those kinds of behaviors? It's important that we ask kids about the questions related to problematic social media use to make sure that they're not experiencing um, some tolerance, withdrawal or dependence symptoms. For instance, questions just like these are easy to ask every few months to kids and then um, engage in different kinds of screen controls if necessary, if your kid is starting to show some difficulties with dependency. One simple thing that we can all do right now is to all put our devices on top of the refrigerator at nine o'clock at night. And as a family say, we are just not doing, our, we are not doing anything with devices when we should be asleep, growing good, healthy, well-functioning brains. Um, it's incredibly important because this is, of course, uh, we want kids' brains to grow to their full size and capacity while they're adolescents. And we know that this is something that's going to potentially affect that. And frankly, it's a community kind of um, norm that we can establish without any legislation, without any tech, comp tech companies doing anything. We can just all decide that it is rude or inappropriate or just not smart to be using tech at nighttime. Um, I just discovered the focus feature on my own phone that um, shuts down all notifications. Even if someone's trying to contact me, I can set up who I'm, I will let kind of break through that should there be an emergency, but I can actually tell the phone to do this for me. And that's something we can set up for our kids as well, or maybe ourselves. Um, it is completely normal and typical that kids are going to engage in social comparisons. So given how likely that is, we need to have dialogues with kids to help them understand and remind themselves that what they see may not be real, it may not be representative, and it may not reflect how they should feel about themselves. But that's going to take a lot of practice and a lot of conversations until that becomes automatic in our heads when we look at social media. And props, uh, and last but not least, we should also be thinking about ways that we can be teaching kids competency before they get online. In just the same way that we don't give someone a driver's license before giving them an actual performance-based exam and a written exam to make sure that they can operate a car safely for themselves and others before they get a license. We should not give license to social media use until they similarly demonstrate competence in a variety of areas, like the ones we just talked about. And there are a number of platforms that are out there that start to make that easy to do, but also this is the kind of thing that can be built into every school district. 
With there, we want to stop so we have time for any questions that might come up. But we are grateful that our work has been funded, um, at least to this point, by a donor who uh, allowed us to pay for open access for a brand new handbook on adolescent digital media use and mental health. So for uh, totally for free, anyone can go to this website and watch videos of each chapter or can download the entire book for free. And we want to um, say thank you to the Winston Family Foundation for that generous donation. Well, we're here and all of us are, our mouths are aghast uh, at some of the data that you've shared with us. And we so appreciate the information. We're going to get into some questions right away. Um, so it seems, you know, you, you stress so, so much. So how important it is for us to talk to kids, to lean into their world, even if we don't, we're not grateful about it. We're not happy about it, but to, as I said, lean in, ask questions, be interested, but any suggestions about starting the conversation? I think sometimes it's really hard for us as parents. Yeah, it is really hard. And I think one of the things that we have to do is recognize that the platforms change so frequently. And, you know, what, right now they're very interested in TikTok and Roblox, especially for boys and, um, and a variety of other kinds of platforms. So a good way to start is just by asking them, tell me about this platform. What are the things you can do? What are the things you can't do? Do you know the people that you're talking to? You know, what are the kinds of things you would be likely to say for each other? And to start to ask them, what are the ways in which you feel like you are being encouraged to participate on this? A lot of kids will tell you, you know, I just want to go on and direct message my friends. But when I log in, I get notifications telling me how many followers and likes and alerts. So I feel pressured to get more likes. And that's a great start to the conversation to ask them. I would just say that another thing that's very important is to help kids to make their own decisions by helping them understand that these platforms in many cases were not made because people wanted to invest billions of dollars just to be nice. They were probably made and invested in heavily because someone is making use of those data or someone is somehow benefiting from what, from what children are doing on there. And let kids start to put the pieces of the puzzle together themselves and realize, oh, wait a minute, there may be reasons to get me on here other than my own internal reasons that I want to be on here and help them start thinking about that. We've got another question. Thank you right so there. much. Yeah. Yes, we have another question from uh, one of our people that came in person. Uh, Jen. Hi, Hi there. Um, my daughter is 12. And my question is, I have not set any boundaries with her on social media as of yet. Um, so how do I now go back and set those boundaries without an explosion, which happened yesterday? Um, it's difficult and I realize the importance of setting those. It's just how to do that now that I have not so far in her young life. Yeah, I have a 13 and 11 year old, but I'm looking to Eva. <laughs> if, if you would like to respond, Eva, it's up to you. Yeah, I was looking to you, Mitch, as a researcher and okay. <laughs> personal expert. <laughs> I mean, I will say that, you know, we we very much have talked about, you know, um, like with everything, we learn about places where there may be potential danger or ways in which kids end up feeling badly about themselves. And we really, you know, my kids are not on social media, I will say, but they do. Uh, we do let them text. Um, and we do have, uh, my son has a video game where we allow him to to interact with known contacts. And we've kind of let them know that for their happiness, and it's our job as parents to make sure that they're safe, to understand risks that are more complicated than they might realize. Um, and, uh, and we're eliminating them and we're happy to have a conversation and we're happy to make it contingent on different behaviors and, and we limit it. One of the things that we did that was remarkably powerful, I didn't realize how much it would be, was to open up on the Apple App Store the privacy tab under any app. And I said to them, let's look at this weather app. What do you think this is for? And they said to tell me the weather. And um, I said, that's right. Let's look at the privacy app. It says here that it's taking your data from all of your other apps and it's using it and selling it and making a profit off of it. You know, and they said, wait a minute, isn't it just for the weather? And I said, no, I'm sure that they have nothing to do with the weather company. <laughs> like, you know, and that get, got them to start realizing, oh, wait a minute, there are parts of this that I don't understand. And there are things about this that are not what it seems. And I'm grateful for the protection. The last thing that I'll just say is that um, 
Even I have taught a class to undergraduates at UNC Chapel Hill, where we ask 20 year olds to tell us, tell us about their experiences. And um, the most common response we get from, uh, from those young adults is that they wish that their parents had not listened to them when they were 11 and 12 and had not given them a phone. So sometimes we even will say, you know, we know what you will wish for us to have done years from now, and we're listening to your future self more than what you're saying right now. I think for myself, uh, my boys are uh, 20 and 19. Um, thank you, Jen. And um, you just had to be comfortable with them being mad at you. And that's a really, really hard space to live in. I mean, you know, you you shared uh, your presentation, you shared the numbers, I mean, the amount of screen time that kids are on. I also think to myself, how how much am I on it? I get the little alerts on my phone. Of, you know, you've been on it for seven hours today, but social media is a huge part of my career. Um, you know, we run 22 Facebook groups and, and there's all types of social media that is embedded into my daily life. Um, so it's, it's tough to even be a role model when, when you need to do this for work sometimes, but being able to sit in, in a space where your kids are not happy with you, I think is, um, a tool that parents need help and support with. Um, um, I'm going to, uh, turn this over to another of our attendees. Oh, hi, I know you. <laughs> hi. you. Um, I guess my question is along the lines of the parental controls, uh, there's apps and programs that you can use to actually, you know, watch what your children are doing and you can, it's, it can be pretty invasive. And I guess my question is, like, what are the implications of um, taking away that privacy and sort of, I guess, micromanaging their social experience? I think it's really important to think about this in terms of developmental competencies and how old your child is. So Younger children, I do think, need a little bit more structure and oversight. And teenagers thrive and need autonomy and agency and privacy. So there's certainly a balance. Um, I would say having open discussions and um, and some monitoring of an older adolescent is good. But in some instances, micromanaging and having too much insight into things that they really want to be private could backfire and be negative. So I think you need to really consider the developmental age of your children when thinking about ways to monitor and oversee their use. There are some apps that don't necessarily take away the privacy, but allow you to see what apps they're using and for how long. And then there's other ones where you may see their entire text message streams. And, and, and for some teens, depending on their age, that's probably maybe, um, giving away some of the privacy that they that they seek. Thanks. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I think I wrote down the word hopeless on here. Like, I think some parents truly feel that it's a hopeless battle. Um, what would you say to those parents that are wanting to put these guidelines in place, wanting to be kind of strong in the, the role they play as a parent. I mean, all of that sounds so great when we just get together as adults and say, yeah, yeah. But then you go down home to that 12 year old or that 14 year old or that 16 year old. And it's just much harder to do when you're trying to apply it in your own home. So what would you say to those parents that need that extra support or um, uh, are there success stories that are being shared somewhere or a resource? I think you, you mentioned um, the uh, uh, wait till eighth is that correct? Um, are there other mm -hmm. resources like that? Or, or is there anything you'd like to, to add to, to that, that struggle for parents? There are. There are a number of things. Uh, one is there are a couple of websites that teach competencies that are good for everyone to know. One is called spotthetroll.org, and it te I believe, maybe .com, and it teaches kids how to, uh, it teaches adults, actually, but it's appropriate for kids how to spot a bot account versus a real person account. And I learned a lot from it myself and um, was shocked at how many bot accounts are actually out there. Um, there's another one called Get Bad News. Sorry, I forget if it's .com or .org, but it teaches you the ways that misinformation is uh, concocted to make us believe in it. And then we realize we're all being fooled, whether we like to think that or not, we are sometimes. And that's also appropriate to go over with kids too. Um, that's important. 
There's a technique called mindful social media use, which is actually quite straightforward. It's simply a way in which we get into the habit of before picking up our device to ask ourselves, how long do I have and what are my goals? You know, am I just trying to get rid of my notifications or send a quick note to somebody or I had an idea that I had to post and I'm going to be on for 10 minutes? Because most people report that they get sucked in by the AI and spend hours and hours on there that um, that they didn't expect. And that happens because we're, we just kind of passively let ourselves be pulled in um, rather than saying in advance, you know, I, I am going to use this as a tool, but not as a replacement for my entire social experiences. Um, but I think, you know, I think beyond that, it, it really is, as you say, being comfortable with being the bad guy a little bit and, um, you know, just protecting our kids from what's being done with their data to make a profit, you know, and I think it's, I think it is important to recognize there are safe ways to do it, but having conversations about that can be really helpful. So we've tried a fam, we try family no screen times or no screen days, and then we can talk very honestly with our kids about you know, this is hard for us too. You know, we've also grown accustomed to this and we also have a temptation where we want to do it. But here's why our family's values are more about connecting with others authentically than just getting likes or followers. And here's why that's important and, and really helping them see it as part of a broader societal issue um, and the importance of connecting to real humans rather than just being an entertainment, you know, um, kind of uh, fixation. Hello. My, I have so many questions. <laughs> I'll try to <laughs> contain myself here. This is such good information. And just kind of piggy, piggybacking off of what you just said, I was wondering if your research uh, touched on, you talked about AI. I was wondering about um, if you looked into the algorithm and how that affects us. And then my second question is, my, my kids are actually young. They're seven and five. So we haven't gotten into social media. So I would say, if anything, the algorithm is more my issue. But um, <laughs> as adults, this, this affects us too, right? So even though our brains are developed, technically we're past the age of 25, maybe I am. Um, so I think, I guess my question is, what does your screen time look like as researchers of this topic and as adults? And um, you kind of told us about your, what you do with your children. So I just wanted to, to learn more about what the experts are doing. Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, Dr. Princey and I can share what, what, what we're doing. I think a, a really um, powerful example is watching the social dilemma where the makers of the companies will tell you what they do. And, and, and the, the short answer is they, they, they do not allow their kids on social media at all. Um, I am, I don't, I don't do what I preach. Is that the phrase? Um, so I know the research, but it is very hard. So like, easier said than done, right? And so, you know, the, the, the platforms themselves are built to suck us in, the algorithms and AI do so as well. There's um, research that really shows that, that individuals enjoy and like the algorithms and use the platforms less. There's ways to turn it off. For example, in Instagram, you can have it be like the timeline feed, or you can have it be the algorithm feed, and people prefer the algorithm feed. Um, for younger kids too, these algorithms, you know, it draws them in. I have a two-year-old, so the algorithm is certainly very prevalent on like YouTube kids where it, it's showing him all the, the, the videos that he spends the time watching and sucks him in. So um, it's very tricky. And um, I think one of Dr. Princeton's um, pieces of advice about being mindful is one of the key pieces that I try to do I personally like do not um, go on my phone at night that evidence to me is so clear and my sleep is so valuable to me so screen time at night is something I'm very strict on but other aspects of social media and spending time on it or just the mere hours of of screen time I'm less um, mindful or rigid about thank you As we're about to close, uh, you're in an elevator and you see a preteen, teenager, and a parent. And you can just tell by looking at them that they need to know what you have to teach them. So really quickly, what's your final message that you want to say to those three individuals? The teen, the preteen, the parent. 
Um, go to teensandtech.org. <laughs> um, so, so learn, we will. to learn what we know and, and to help them. You know, I think that, um, I think for the parent, it's a lot of empathy and commiseration. You know, it's hard. It really is hard. But at the very least, you've got to get them off their screens at nine o'clock. I mean, that to me just, feel, I agree with Dr. Telzer. It's, and I think so much could be saved just with that one rule alone. And if we all did it, then we would all have a culture to do it. Mm -hmm. I think with that teen is, um, is to help them understand how their data might be used and to help and help them ask themselves, are, are you making decisions on your social media use or is social media making decisions on your social life and help them to start being, um, to start owning their behavior a little bit and understanding that, you know, they have an opportunity and for, Preteens, I would tell them to take every opportunity, and for that preteen, I would say, take every opportunity that you can to run and play and have face-to-face -face and voice-to-voice -voice conversations while you can and start asking yourself what about that is rewarding that you won't be able to get on the device. That's good. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been a very worthwhile hour, and already we can't wait to have you back. So I'm grateful to the people who actually <laughs> came here in the auditorium today, and to our two professionals, Nina, thank you so much, Kids Matter, Kathy, thank you for the branch, and we'll do this again. What fun we had. Thank you so much. And this is where we go hug the kids, but do come back 7 o'clock and tell someone. You all know someone who needs to hear this information. Have them listen in or join us here in person tonight. Thank you both so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let's stop there. So there's a couple of minutes left for questions, but we want to mention that all of our work is supported by generous donations from uh, outside funders. And one of those funders made it possible for us to publish this book, an edited volume on all the research um, on digital media use and paid for it to be open access, which means that this is an absolutely free book for anyone who goes to this website and just wants to download an entire book with information and resources. It's there for you for free. Thanks. Okay, so my hand is killing me now from 10 pages of notes that I've taken during the course of this conversation. Uh, I think what I'm hearing that is especially important is this idea about the communicating with your children, um, leaning into them um, when they, when even though you're not excited about what they have to say, even though you're not excited about what they're doing, but to really be there and really feel, make them feel that you want to be a part of that world. Am I right about that? Absolutely. Um, and I'll say that um, when we teach undergraduates on these topics, and these are, are you know, smart, high achieving UNC Chapel Hill 20 year olds, a lot of them tell us that um, in addition to, to wishing they had the opportunity to talk with their families more about what they were experiencing, they frankly wish that their parents had not given in to their demands and their pleading when they were 12 years old. And they really, really now look back with regret that they were so persistent and successfully so. They want their parents to be the bad guy <laughs> so they can tell their friends, sorry, it's not me. I'm being forced to get off my phone or I'm not being allowed to get on my phone. It's actually what they're telling us years later they wish had happened in retrospect. Um, there was a question that came in from someone who has a child who is eight years old and uh, playing, even playing these games they're seeing that that it's causing anxiety in their children. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Are you seeing that as well? This constant? Yeah, um, you know, kids are, are feeling like they are having a hard time getting off these devices or these platforms, even when they want to. And they're, you know, because of the reasons we talked about with their brain development, they're just not as equipped to make those decisions for themselves and inhibit their own behavior. Interestingly, we're also starting to see in the literature a growing rate of social anxiety among kids who spend a lot of time online because um, when you're online, you can pre-plan what you're going to say, how you're going to say it. You can show it to your friends before you hit send. 
But in real life, we don't have that opportunity. And that kind of extemporaneous, spontaneous speech is becoming quite nerve wracking for a lot of young people. They're losing those skills now. Am I right that um, you were, that if, if you can um, be aware of the minutes, the hours that your child is online, it will give you some insight into down the road problems with depression, anxiety, that kind of, so that, that alone, that, and that's available to us uh, right now, right? Now I know yeah. you've got a question. Yeah, I think we might have a, a couple of questions here. If his son is playing games online. Is it okay that he's playing games online with his friends? If it's not social media. If it's not social media. I, think, uh, yeah, I can say, you know, my 11 year old likes to play online games with his friends. There are a few things that we've chosen to do because it makes sense for our family that might not make sense for other families. but. We have shut off the ability for strangers to interact with them as well. So they can only interact with people that we have listed as friends with their contacts kind of handle or login on there. That's number one. Number two is that we limit the time, but we let them know that if uh, we let my son know if he'd like to do more time on FaceTime, we allow that, but not just on the video game, because when we've been within earshot, we don't feel like it's providing the opportunity for as many reciprocal social skills as it mm -hmm. is when you're actually on FaceTime and you're having a conversation. It's a lot of bam, bam, I got him, good shot. And we think that's fine for a little while, but it's not building the relationship skills we know are so critical at this age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Uh, you have another question, Nina? Yeah, I, I had a, a one one question. Uh, what happens if you your child um, experiences bullying that another child is being bullying? How do you talk with your child about how to handle that um, personally, and then what they should do about it? Yeah, it's very challenging. I mean, one important consideration when somebody witnesses another person being bullied is it's also going to impact the person who's witnessing it. So the person who is bullied is certainly going to have their, their, their feelings hurt. It's going to impact their well-being. but others who are witnessing it. So if your child witnesses somebody being bullied, it's going to make them feel bad too. Um, this is sort of this idea of, of, of empathy and this vicarious experience of, of seeing others that might be hurt. So not only is it important to talk about to your child ways to stick up for the other kid to deal with the bully, but also to talk to them about their own feelings and how this made them feel, because it is potentially going to um, um, have this, this uh, association with their own feelings of potential distress or anxiety um, related to having seen that. So finding ways to talk to the, your child and find the, the tools to maybe that's intervene and say something to the bully, or maybe that is um, saying something nice and sticking up um, to the kid who might be being bullied, but also finding um, some ways to talk about your child's um, feelings that they have experienced through seeing that. It was so interesting what you said about this, how the cyberbullying is so much worse than the bullying. I, I never really thought about that, but the likes that follow, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's, just, that's just heartbreaking. Um, for both of you, what's the, when you give these presentations, what's the one question that keeps coming up over and over? Mm -hmm. I would say one of the most common questions we get, which is very challenging, is like, what age... Mm -hmm. Is it okay for my kid to use social media or how much time is okay for my kid to use social media? And the, the hardest thing about this is that, that there's not an answer. There's no one size fits all. You don't wake up one day with the competencies to use social media at a certain age. In fact, some adolescents may be at greater risk than they were as children without their brains being super attuned to their peers. So it's not like you suddenly are mature enough to use social media. And then when it comes to the amount of time, there's not a, a, a an amount where it's good and then some extreme level where it's bad. It's really about what they're doing online and the competencies that they bring um, when they're interacting online. So an adolescent connecting with their close friends 
a, a while online doing that is probably okay. An adolescent being exposed to <clears throat> cyber hate or other things, just a few minutes is going to be potentially negative. Dr. Princeton, you want to take that question as well? What's the number one question? Yeah, I I completely agree. And, and that is a really, really common question. You know, we often get questions about how, how can I talk with my child about having them engage in less time, especially when I know it's likely to cause a tantrum, you know, and, and for any age, quite frankly. Um, and that, that is really hard. I, I do think that knowing that older people um, really wish their parents had done that can help parents feel empowered. Knowing that this is about protecting your child's brain development can help parents feel motivated. But the fact is sometimes it is hard that we have to tell kids it's something that they enjoy, that they like, that they find to be fun, that they don't understand why it's bad can be really hard. And um, one of the things that, that I've seen um, used really successfully is to try and help kids to make some of that decision themselves, which is sometimes done by gi giving them the insight that, you know, it's it's likely that some of um, their understanding of why social media exists might um, not reflect some of the realities that their data are being used to make other people a profit in some cases, that um, these devices were, were made specifically to try and get people to stay on for as long as possible beyond their own desires to stay on, that the people who invented these platforms have uh, made sure that their own children will never be on the platforms. Um, and to show them within the app store, you know, that what they think might be an app or a, 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 a um, forum designed for one purpose is actually in some cases taking data from all of their other apps and all their other behavior and, and using it. And in, in more gentle ways than I just described it right now, um, giving kids some of that information can help mm -hmm. them to start realizing, oh, wait a minute, this is different than what I experienced. This is this is um, new information, and now I want to take more control because, especially adolescents, they want to feel so much like an individual that's making their own autonomous decisions, and it's often very helpful for them to realize that maybe the platforms are starting to make decisions for them, so they should um, they should make decisions based on their own accord, not just because their parents force them to. Yeah. Let them know that how they're being manipulated. Yeah, I love that. And of course, we talked about the modeling. You know, one of my favorite expressions I've heard here, uh, kids hear 1% of everything you say and 100% of everything you do. So we, we have to be mindful. And as you said, give ourselves grace. This is hard, hard, hard work. Nina, do you want to say goodbye and thank you? Do you have I left? Have we forgotten anything tonight? Yeah, so this is great. Been many thanks from all the the team here from Naperville, Illinois. We're very grateful, grateful for our partnership with uh, GPS and appreciative of the branch and also the Naperville Park District for being involved uh, tonight. So many thanks from Kids Matter from Naperville. Uh, we're grateful for all the work that you're doing and we hope to see you in person sometime in the area. We would love to invite you to come. Absolutely. And Thank you so us, much. Thanks for having us. Please keep up the good work. All right. And and this is Thank where you. we go hug the children. So we're going to do that right now. Thank you so okay. much. See you next time, everybody. Thank Take care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.